tattered shorts with white socks pushed down and then like black old men shoes and then hair that kind of looked like Nick Cave birthday party. Welcome to episode 21 of the Who Cares Anyway podcast. My guest on this episode is Odell Nails, drummer slash percussionist for Spawn Ranch and later Majesty Crush, a couple of bands from the Detroit, Michigan area in the uh, mid to late 80s in Spawn Ranch's case and then early 1990s in the case of Majesty Crush. Now, you might be asking, what does this have to do with San Francisco? That being the uh, geographical center of this podcast and what it tends to revolve around. Well, in uh, the mid-1980s, 85 to 87-ish, there was a small record label, Insight Records, that released four albums during its existence. Two of those were by the band Glorious Den, whose uh, frontman, Eric Cope, was the main person behind Insight Records. There was an LP, actually a double LP compilation to sell kerosene door-to-door, and finally an LP by Spawn Ranch, their only LP entitled Thickly Settled. And on top of that, they actually came out to the Bay Area to record it at the studio of Matt Wallace. And while I don't usually tease guests like this, I can tell you that the guest on the next episode is going to be Matt Wallace himself. And so there's a little bit of thematic continuity here uh, between this episode, the next one, and for that matter, the previous one with uh, Bill Gould of Faith No More. But anyway, back to Spawn Ranch. Uh, There was a sort of kinship that Odell describes in this uh, episode uh, between them and Glorious Den, both in terms of their maybe their sound, their style, the sort of mood they created, and the minimalist sort of instrumental setups they were working with. That is the uh, basis for the connection here, that uh, sort of relationship between Glorious Den and Spawn Ranch. I should mention that when I set up this interview, it wasn't uh, intended to be part of this podcast series. I'm actually doing a series of interviews for, oh, let's just say a project that I'm working on with, with Eric Cope. And as part of that, I had interviewed uh, Odell's bandmate or former bandmate in Spawn Ranch, uh, Brad Horowitz, and he suggested that I talk to Odell. And again, these were not podcast interviews, but as soon as I heard uh, Odell start talking, uh, you know, in response to the first question I asked, I kind of had the idea that, hey, I think people might be interested in this because he's a good storyteller. And these are stories that, even if they are taking place outside of San Francisco, are still very much relevant to the sort of flavor of things, you know, that are described in the book. And so as a bonus, we do get a little bit of a history lesson on uh, Detroit slash Ann Arbor area underground music in that era. For those of us like uh, myself who are not particularly well versed in that. And we also hear a little bit about the evolution, uh, or at least the transition from Spawn Ranch to Majesty Crush, who incidentally have a reissue coming out uh, this week or through Numero Group. It's called Butterflies Don't Go Away. And again, that is coming out this week, March 29th, two days from now as I record this. And so without any further ado, I'll step aside and let us get on to the interview with Odell Nails. Brad and I, uh, in high school, and pretty much throughout a majority of our lives, were touched by punk, hardcore, post-punk, and goth culture. Um, Back in a magic time, early 80s, where if you were lucky enough to catch this, you know, to, to be interested in this at all, it was a true subculture where... Just looking a certain way, you 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 had a sense, no matter where you were, that you had something in common with people. You you, you know, it was you can't have it anymore because of the internet, um, because no secrets can be kept, uh, and anything that you can't keep secret can't can't really form its 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 own little subculture. But back then, 
Uh, there were vinyl record stores, one of them being Sam's Jams, which was located in Ferndale, Michigan, um, that catered to a lot. Of, it was large in size. That was what made it different than a lot of like smaller little indie record stores. But it was independent and had a lot of, you know, it had its own punk, hardcore, goth, alternative kind of countercultural music section. In fact, sections. Uh, and it had a robust fanzine section. And, you know, at that point, anything that had certain aesthetics was very, very attractive to, to, to Brad and I. And wiring department makes, makes its way amongst many, many other uh, fanzines onto the shelves of Sam's Jams. And I was immediately drawn to it simply for the aesthetic. It looks like a, it looks like a factory records, you know, it could just as easily be a Joy Division cover or... <laughs> Um, you know, some kind of uh, UK post-punk minimalistic aesthetic. And that 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 kind of stuff is going to draw me. F I, I, bought, I can't tell you how many records I bought just because they had a certain vibe on the artwork, having no idea what it sounded like. But if I'm, you know, I, I looked at, at Wiring Department. I think it was the issue that was more like a newspaper folded in half. And it just drew to me and I could tell and some of the bands I'd heard of because again we were absolute fetishes fetishes when it came to this stuff I mean obsessed you know Carolina Rainbow Trucks you know it, it, it's changed its name <laughs> so many times Jad Fair on the cover I believe might have been Eric's girlfriend at the time who we, we of course ended up meeting later but I bought that fanzine and in that fanzine because um, I was obsessed with scenes, quote unquote, scenes in different cities and the similarities and differences amongst these scenes of people who all like the same kind of subculture music. And I'm flipping through these bands. And again, so, you know, there was a picture of Thurston Moore live on stage. Great. I ended up ripping it out of an issue and posting it on my college dorm room wall. It was so cool because it caught him with his hair flying up in the air. Um, and you don't see Thurston looking that kind of like punkish you know <laughs> but uh I, then i'm reading glorious then and i'm reading about glorious then and i'm like this this sounds super super interesting next trip to sam's jams what do you think i do i buy glorious den's album and uh same kind of artwork aesthetic on the cover of his record and yeah pure joy division vibes i mean it was just like you know a, a, a minimalist we were very much at that time into tribal drumming. And I think this is one of the things that Eric loved about Spawn Ranch is that um, the, the drumming that I, I I was doing, which was done on my knees, by the way, I did not even drum in a sit down kit, had no idea how to play a sit down kit, uh, but had this kind of custom created percussion for lack of a better word, layout that used parts of a traditional drum set and I would play on my knees. And so it's pure tribal. And that was one of the things that attracted me to Glorious Den. They had that. They had the kind of moody, you know, you know, Eric's vocals. You've heard this music now, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. yeah. So um, par par partners in arms, even though we'd never met each other. So there was a venue in Detroit, in the Detroit area called the Greystone. The Greystone was one of, I don't want to say many because there wasn't many, but one of one of several extremely important punk venues in Detroit punk history. I had the last show the Misfits ever played. Uh, but, you know, any given weekend or, or, or weekday, for that matter, at the Greystone was a who's who of, you know, touring hardcore bands, you know, no trend, uh, endless list. By that point, Spawn Ranch was playing gigs. And I immediately, I think I contacted the promoter and said, we got to play with this band. I mean, there's, you know, we got to play with Glorious Den. And Slaughterhouse was a, was a band, another band that we played a lot of shows with, including this Glorious Den lineup. I'm sure they were on it. They were more of a noise, cacophony, um, you know, pure kind of screaming, shouting, not really songs. But there were only a handful of bands in the Detroit area that would play with a Glorious Den who weren't just doing straight hardcore at that point. And nice. Spawn Ranch was certainly one of them. And uh, so we get on the bill. And I'd never met Eric either. You know, it was just one of those times, just like, you know, when we would play with Swans or play with Jesus and Mary Chain or whatever, you're just, we're just playing with heroes. We don't even have any expectation of 
actually meeting. And Spawn Ranch is setting up on stage. We had an unusual setup. Bob Bob Sterner, our singer and shaman, rest in peace, getting ready to go into his voodoo kind of channeling seance vibe. And all of a sudden, right before we're about to start the first song, the cops bust in. And the Greystone, you know, a lot of these, these venues <laughs> were different levels of legal, but the Greystone didn't usually get raided. I think they had enough paperwork or whatever to, to keep, you know, keep the cops away or however you keep the cops away. And, uh, but not that night. So the cops came in and uh, I mean, literally we were about to start a song uh, to the point where the crowd who, you know, normally wouldn't have necessarily done this for us, but they, they basically started to chant, let them play, let them play. It was one of the most exciting nights of music I've ever been involved with in bands where I didn't actually play a single song. So you kind of had this mini, mini movie scene playing out. And Eric, uh, of course, who's, I mean, there were two or three bands before Glorious Den was going to play. So of course he didn't get to play, but he had, I think he, he was so curious by our stage setup, I believe. And we had a cassette. We had cassettes at that time. So quickly handed Eric a cassette. I said, man, you know, it sucks. Obviously, this is not going to happen, but we we love your music. We love your fanzine. Keep us in mind. And next thing you know, the guy, not next thing you know, who knows back then, because there's no internet or anything like yeah. that. But uh, he contacts us and says, "We, I just love this tape. I love this tape, and I love this tape so much. You need to fly out here and make a record. I need you, Brad and Bob, out here. We're going to make it happen. You're going to stay at our place. Um, we're going to feed you. We're going to put you up. I got a studio lined up, and we're going to make an album. And that uh, is exactly what we did. Blew our minds. Nothing close to this had ever happened to us before. And that is how, you know, that's the night we met Eric. Okay, yeah. And um, on the timeline, I've been able to sort of, you know, approximate this, that they were touring in the spring of 86 and then you all were out there by August. Wow. That was bad. Does that, so a few months, does that sound about right? Oh, I could, I, you know more than me. You you need to piece it together with facts. And if that's <laughs> the facts, that's the facts. I, I had no idea it was that quick, but that's awesome. Yeah. I'm not, and I'm not a, not a hundred percent sure, but based on what uh, I showed Brad, one of the flyers I had come across because he said he mentioned that you all played a few shows yep. out in the Bay Area and were probably out there for a few weeks, maybe. I'm not sure. Yeah, that sounds about right. Again, we stayed in Eric's house. We played at least two gigs. I know Glorious Den played a gig we went to that we didn't play, but we played with them twice. Um, kind of these art venues uh, that were super, really just awesome. We played Santa Cruz, which was the... The one show that we still Bay Area, as you know, but, but you know, kind of out of the SF area proper. And yeah, these were these were definitely with Glorious Den, and we were definitely out. There. I mean, look, it took a week to do the record. If well, three yeah. four days. And as you know, it was produced by Andy Wallace, who's now gone on to be like a Grammy winning yeah. producer. Matt, Matt Wallace. <laughs> Matt Wallace. Matt Wallace. There you go. Matt Wallace. But they both, yeah, who, who both, yeah, both of them worked with uh, Faith No More. But Matt, being the one who also worked with Glorious Den and 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 you all, yeah, I was going to ask about that because that studio was over in Oakland. Yes. Right? Yes, we would go. We would head over to Oakland. You know, I don't remember how many days it really took to track the record. And again, we were just like we were just punk about it. You know. If you asked me to tune a drum, I, I would like look at you confused. <laughs> it was whatever pawn shop instrumentation, found pieces of metal. You know, we were very much into the whole like Einstein's and Neubaden and Savage Republic. And, um, you know, anything can be hit. Anything can make sound. And that's kind of how we approached it, even in the studio. And and with the, with the setup of my drumming, my left hand, now, now I know enough about drumming to know exactly, you know, at least what I'm had to do to keep rhythm, the left hand was basically the bass drum. So I had a rack tom detuned closest to me, which the left hand would emulate as a kick drum, and the right hand would be hitting a snare, which would be kind of above the, the little tom. And then I had a big floor tom, again, laying flat, leaned up 
towards me. And then a, a floor tom, another floor tom. So it was kind of this. I don't know if you have you seen pictures of Swan Ranch? Um, not any live pictures, but I was going to ask if are you left handed? No, I'm right handed. I'm right handed. Okay. Okay. Um, so that's it. So then completely self taught, I imagine. Oh, totally. Completely improvised. I, you know, I'd like to use fancy words like self taught, but, and that is, that is accurate, but more like nothing's going to, more just DIY. Like this is what it takes for me to make, to, to play drums. I don't know. I don't know any other way to play. And 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 later I did morph in my you know in a next band Magic to Crush I did switch to a sit down kit but yeah back then it was just and then of course it was unique I I didn't realize it's it, it did look interesting and it did kind of it was different so um, a lot of people were intrigued by I think just the difference you know yeah because I'm just thinking uh, I not any real drummer but i i, I think uh as, as a right hander you're normally hitting the the snare with your left hand correct absolutely absolutely did you uh did you continue playing um i don't want to say backward but using your right hand on the snare when you switched to a full kit no nope, no nope, no nope. uh i i did the full yeah no once i got to a sit down kit i did start using left hand on snare right hand on hi hat and you know and 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 of course the hardest part for me because I'd never used my legs before, right foot on the kick, left foot on the hi hat. That was the time consuming part of learning how to sit down drum. But yeah, yeah. yeah when in Spawn Ranch times, man, I mean, it's just so many of the bands we love didn't have traditional drummers. I mean, even Jesus and Mary Chain didn't have a traditional drummer. You got you had Bobby Gillespie standing up hitting two drums. So, you know. We didn't know enough to like maybe my beats could expand with a full kit. We weren't even thinking that way. Right. And uh, Brad mentioned that at least some of your percussion had previously been like decorations or on your wall at your house. Is that uh, accurate? Maybe early on? It's completely accurate. The first okay. the first time I ever drummed anything, I wasn't even supposed to be the drummer. I was supposed to, I think, play guitar. Brad and I again, DIY, punk rock, every, you know, we're going to start a band. We have no idea what that means, but we're doing it anyway. I think he and I were both going to play guitar and our friend Kevin was going to try to drum and drum at that point meant we had drumsticks and he was going to keep a rhythm on the floor and couldn't keep up, couldn't keep time. He just couldn't keep any kind of beat. So we couldn't get anything going. So I took the drumsticks from him and started, you know, hitting a beat on the ground, probably carpeted floor. And realized real quickly I could keep time. And at the next step was, I think we literally, I think we had another one. And I looked up and we saw the souvenirs from Jamaica that my parents had up on a windowsill in, a, in the basement of the house I grew up in. And Brad and I never, never shy to use something to, to, to drum on. We just got the, we just pulled the souvenirs off the wall you know, kind of different kind of bongos and kind of things like that. And that that was the start of my first quote unquote kit. I also remember disassembling and Brad, this is something we still laugh about, disassembling my parents' doorbells from the hinges to because we thought they might make a nice little chime sound. And uh, my mom freaking out and telling us to get those doorbell chimes back up as quickly as possible. So whenever Brad visits the house I grew up in, we go to the doorbells because that's a wonderful memory for us. Um, but yeah, it was, and, and I mean, fine, you know, junkyards, junkyards had the best coils and pieces of steel and uh, rods, you know, we drop rods and, 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 and we carried our stuff around. Here's a funny one. Flying to San Francisco, we put our equipment in, Indian rucksacks. You know those big burlap rucksacks? Okay, yeah. Okay. That's what a guitar... One of them would hold a guitar. Another one would hold some drums. We literally didn't have any cases or anything like that. Most of our stuff were in these rucksacks. So we went to the airport, tied up these rucksacks, and we quote-unquote checked the baggage. Brad and I and Bob are sitting on a plane... And we look out the window and there's a rucksack going up the, the conveyor belt into the plane with drums falling out of it. Like literally the, the, the people working the runway had to like put the drums back in the rucksack. Uh, 
Yeah, we were, we were, we would show up at venues because we started getting real gigs. Like Spawn Ranch, we opened up for, we opened up for My Bloody Valentine, we opened up for Swans, we opened up for uh, Sonic Youth, Butthole Surfers. Like we started getting real gigs with, you know, and when we would roll up with rucksacks, the sound man would never take it seriously. You know, um, it, it would take until after we played until people realized, oh, okay, it's not a joke. You know, Brad mentioned a little bit of this, and maybe you could, I don't know if you could elaborate on it, kind of the juxtaposition between, you know, yeah, what, what you all were as a band and what you were just saying about the equipment that you had and, and kind of improvising things. And then you find yourselves uh, in a more or less a professional studio. And and uh, yeah, what, what do you remember about that as far as, you know, did it feel like uh, pressure because the tape's rolling or? or well, Hilarious. We, we, we. <laughs> I can't remember whether or not Spawn Ranch had actually been in a studio before. Even if we had, I know the one we would have been in uh, with a guy named Mike Clark who went on to do some great stuff in Detroit, but it would have been nothing like the one in Oakland, which was a real pro studio. So yeah, it's the same thing when you show up with the, to the sound man at, at some real venue with rucksacks and, 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 and like pawn shop stuff falling out of it. What do you think Matt did when we first opened the door? Now Matt, Matt had Matt had done hardcore bands. He knew Eric. He knew what he was. You know, he knew. You know, Bon Jovi wasn't showing up. So, <laughs> you know, yeah, he, he 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 rolled with it. But I mean, first of all, miking my drums, nightmare, nightmare, miking miking this setup that I'm describing to you. Wouldn't wish that on any audio engineer, because again, you got to mic stuff. Uh, you you got to turn a, a tom into a kick drum because again that's that's doing the beats so you know detune guitars all a guitar with all, all tunes the same note um, hitting guitars with drumsticks literally hitting a guitar between putting a placing a guitar between two chairs Brad uh, on a song called Countdown we'd lay a guitar on that all had the same tuning drone note probably an E and Brad played the song with two drumsticks hitting it like a drum and you know these are concepts that you're you know that, that an audio engineer is going to have to get their head around in a real studio so overwhelmed thrilled listen we're, we were too happy and naive to be nervous um i do remember when bob cut the vocal to either dissipation i think it's dissipation yeah when he did dissipation that was when Matt realized why we were there because Bob teared up. I think we, I, I don't want to put, I don't want to make this more dramatic than it is, but um, playing that song back in that studio was emotional and beautiful uh, and kind of validated, I think, even to Matt, why we were there. Uh, and Eric had seen it all along. What I didn't know about Eric is Eric really loves the voice more than any, at least at that time. And I think he'd even described this in a conversation he had with me. He loved the vocals. Like he was a Bob Dylan guy. He liked lyrics, lyrics and vocals, almost folky. He was very much into folky artists, um, were extremely important to him. And that's why he has vocals so high up in the mix. I'm more, and it went to even more extremes when I got into shoegaze. To me, the vocals are just kind of more of another instrument. So often I'm used to loving music where the vocals are way down, not way down, but at the same level the guitar, bass, and the drums might be, not necessarily raised above it. And that was, I'm pretty sure that if we had any conflict in the studio with Eric and just taste and aesthetics, it was me saying the vocals are too loud. Um, okay. too high up in the mix, but it's exactly what he's looking for. Cause again, he, he saw Bob and heard Bob. He thought Bob and was and is correct with this. Bob's a shaman and you know, Bob is gone now. I'm sure Brad shared that with you. He's been gone for years. Yeah. Uh, 2008. Yeah. 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 But Eric, 
what really drew Eric to Spawn Ranch was Bob. What, what what drew a lot most people to Spawn Ranch was probably Bob. Bob, um, even beyond his vocal live was, you know, he grew up in a family um, that was part of it was very religious and you know, I, I'm not quite sure, and I sh certainly don't want to misspeak here, but might have involved, you know, f snakes and, 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 and I gotcha. just, you know, but, but in a Christian, nothing, nothing, right. nothing bad, but just right. um, almost Appalachian. And um, I think that had something to do with his upbringing, and I think that stayed with him. And I think it stayed with him to the point where his live performances were cathartic and almost, you, yeah, you might want to say channeling something there. Yeah, definitely channeling some kind of like religious fervor. And that's something else Eric loved. You know, that's what I love. That's what Bob, that, that's why Brad and I chose Bob to, to be the singer of Spawn Ranch is because we saw that when he was in a the band before he was in called Grief Factory. Yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to ask about that because I, you know, I don't know much at all about uh Detroit in the 80s, or I could say, however much I might know about San Francisco, that's how much I don't know about Detroit. But yeah, what what were they like? And and um because I, I gather that both you and Brad were, I don't know, fans uh or at least familiar with that band before you started up uh Spawn Ranch. Yeah, we became we wouldn't miss a Grief Factory show. Um because we we just couldn't believe what we couldn't believe there was a band like that in Detroit. Like we we thought you had to go to England to see that. Like that was like, and they ended up opening for the cult. But that to us was the closest thing you're ever going to have to a Southern Death Cult, or uh, Dead Can Dance, or you know, I mean, that was truly to us what post punk was all about. So yeah, there was a point where if Refactor's playing, Brad and Odell are there, and it really came to a head, you know, I mean, they're lighting candles. It's a seance, for God's sake. It's, again, it's religious, it's gothy. That's going to play right in with my aesthetic at the time. But the, but, 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 tra but not, not like all black gothy, like more real than that. It's like, I, I mean, I remember Bob would wear stuff like shorts, tattered shorts with white socks, Push down and then like black old men shoes and then hair that kind of looked like Nick Cave birthday party. Like you don't make that up. Like that was coming. It was there was a genuine um, creation of it. It was it, it, it was it was it was it was it had Bob in it, but it was clearly also influenced. I mean, Bob turned me on to the creatures, for instance. I was huge into the Susie and the Banshees, but I didn't I didn't I didn't heard the creatures yet. The side project with Susie and Budgie, uh, Dead Can Dance. I owe that to Bob. Bob was the one that said, you need to hear this band, Dead Can Dance. Um, yeah, so Brad and I are going. I, we had no idea that apparently Bob was either looking to do something else or the band wasn't getting along. I'm not quite sure why Grief Factory splintered, but we might have had something to do with it. Brad and I were fairly aggressive. Like, Bob, we're starting a band. You, you're in it. <laughs> Okay. Uh, you need to come jam with us. We, 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 it's a, it's a feeling. We didn't put it in these words. Who knows how you speak as an '80s post punk teenager? But you know, we're, we're on your wavelength. We need to be around you. We need to, we need to create. And um, yeah. And then Spawn Ranch had its first practice outside in kind of the side lawn of my house where I grew up in uh, Southfield, Michigan. That was. We, we, you know, whenever Brad again visits the house, we kind of stand there. We stand outside my house where the first Spawn Ranch practice was. So you said, you know, that you couldn't believe there was a band in Detroit like that. And, and I'm trying to kind of picture, I mean, I imagine what this would have been like 80, mid 80s, 85 ish, maybe. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and so I don't know um, if you can, if there's such a thing as like a center of gravity to that, to the music scene, would it have still been pretty much? hardcore or was there other stuff that was branching out in other directions yeah uh, okay so it's still hardcore at that point although it's getting generic so people are getting bored so so the the, the the hardcore band that really drove the city one of them negative approach 
okay. had already began to form Laughing Hyenas. Okay. Clearly influenced by Nick Cave, you know, the birthday party. So that was really one of the first statements in Detroit in terms of growing out of hardcore. And of course, Farm Ranch went on to play shows with Laughing Hyenas, uh, as did Majesty Crush, funny enough, my, my next band. But um, yeah, the, 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 anything John Brandon, who was the singer of Negative Approach and later the Hyenas did, was kind of the epicenter of Detroit punk and hardcore. Uh, you know, you also had the Necros, the Necros who kind of went another path. They went more to kind of pre grunge and would have loved to have been a, you know, they, they were just a little too early, you know, a little bit later, they could have caught the grunge wave. But uh, that was also an important kind of, you know, barometer of what, what was going on. And then you had a few other, other kind of we weird bands, for lack of a better word. But, uh, you know, that, that was the lane Spawn Ranch could step into. Like, if there were certain bands playing, you couldn't really book anyone else to open for. Psychic TV. If Psychic TV's coming, who else is going to open for them? You got to have Spawn Ranch because there's, there's not enough weird bands. And, um, okay. again, I you know, I, I, Slaughterhouse, who, who was not my musical cup of tea, but they were one of the other bands that could, you know, open this stuff because they weren't playing hardcore. Or, and what that by that point was starting to be called generic hardcore. Okay, yeah, yeah that that make, that makes sense. And and now and and kind of shifting it back to to the Bay Area. I know you weren't out there for that long, but what was I don't know what was your impression of you know either the 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 space itself that you know the the places that you saw and or like what at what you were able to pick up on from the the music scene there. Yeah, so I'm at that point. I'm getting around. So you know, no one would go with me, but I went alone. I went to the farm um, and saw an incredible hardcore bill at the farm, which was probably I don't know MDC and BGK and God knows who else. And that was completely mind blowing to me. I'd never been to a hardcore show with like animals literally walking outside um, within a city confine. You know. Um, are you familiar with the farm? You've heard of it, right? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, I would see X. I remember this. I don't know what the venue was. This was more of a legit, you know, a traditional kind of venue, not a big one. And saw X, who were past their prime, you know, in between their most influential hardcore phase, but before their kind of attempt to kind of break commercial. So they're still doing all the old songs, but they're not playing, you know, big, huge venues. And so this was a pretty small venue to see X. Um, so that I, I'm getting litmus, litmus tests on other punks. Because at, at that point, I'm telling you, I felt I had every it's something in common with every single person in the room. It's something like that. You might not talk to everybody, but anyone there is there because they're driven to be there. They're not there because it's a cool thing to do. They're not there... They're there because it's a calling. And um, San Francisco was no different. Just a little different flavor because, you know, a little different background. Um, Eric, again, was more into the slightly older, arty, post-punk scene. So um, I, I remember the venues, again, being more like art galleries. Like these were, in fact, one was called the ATA Gallery or something <laughs> like that. That's probably yeah, I, the flyer that Brad showed you. Exactly, yeah. And, um, you know, they're, they've... They've since moved uh, to, uh, you know, I, I think about a year after that, they moved to a place on Valencia Street, uh, which is, uh, but that's where, when I, when we had the book release event uh, last March, that was uh, at ATA. Oh, uh, but, uh, so, <laughs> but not, again, not the same location, because that one was down in the south of Market, more kind of industrial-ish area yep, at yep. the time. Yeah. Yep. Um, you know, listen, here's another thing. We... You know, we were from not from Detroit, but we are we are we are we are seeing gigs and hanging out in downtown Detroit, which in the 80s was a dangerous place. So we probably one of the things we probably felt with San Francisco is, wow, this is safe. Look how clean it is. There's people walking <laughs> around on the streets like, you know, it just blew our minds to go to any big city that had a lot of people. And, and foot traffic, like, like, you know, just, you know, so, so part of it was kind of utopian, you know, sunshine, you know, we, we did all the, you know, I remember being in the mission district, 
Uh, I think I walked by where Valencia Tool and Die was because I just wanted to say I walked by it because I think it was already okay. closed by that point. Um, okay, yeah. That's where ATA is now, Next, basically next door to where the Tool and Die used to really? be. Really? Two doors down. Two doors no. down, I think, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. Uh, I mean, because, you know, as much as we're in the post-punk, we're also reading Maximum Rock and Roll. So I'm, I'm, you know, which is, of course, right out of the Bay Area, right out of the mission. So... I know where to go. You know what I mean? There's 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 ways to find out where the and of course you go to a record store. I can't remember Hate Ashbury, I think. But I don't think Amoeba would be open yet. But um uh, but Rough Trade was still open and they were on uh in South of Market on a pretty rough stretch of Sixth Street, the Rough Trade store. Yeah, then I bet you I bet you guess what? Then I I'm sure that's where I would have gone because I remember specifically one of the records I bought in, on that trip. Was a Jesus and Mary chain, some candy talking seven inch, you know, fold out seven inch, and I bought it at a record store. I'm sure it's rough trade. I, I bet it was rough trade. Yeah, and yeah, and then Eric's home was 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 strangely clean and pleasant and warm and almost you know neat and almost. Um, Honestly, uh, 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 I uh, I would almost equate it to someone who was into meditation, or and then we have his girlfriend. Now I apologize; I don't remember his girlfriend, and and yeah. I know they they Mary. started Mar murder dog together. Mary, yeah, Mary Downs, yes, Mary Downs. Okay, so Mary Downs was on the cover of a wiring department, and I had a crush on her. Maybe that's the one I bought at Sam's Jams because okay. I love that picture, and I thought she looked so cool, and. I think if there was any nervous moment, it was probably for me personally, it was probably meeting Mary Downs <laughs> because I didn't know. And of course, I'm realizing, oh, that's Eric's girlfriend, hands off and all that stuff. And I was so shy at that point. I couldn't talk to girls if I wanted to. But um, y y yeah, that, just to be staying in the house that created that magazine, which five months ago, I'm pulling stuff and pinning it up on my wall is crazy. I mean, it was wild. And and so these were, yeah, these were very well-read adults. You know, another, I'll tell you one, the biggest share Eric did with me was Wire. He loved 154. And he played 154. And to this day, 154 is one of my favorite albums. And that is that is specifically due to Eric Cope. Okay, yeah, I'm trying to pick. You know, I don't know where they were living at the time. If they were living in the Mission or uh, the Visadero, or I think yeah. the Visadero. This didn't feel Mission. I don't okay. Really yeah, and they. Yeah, and again, the house was dope. I mean, the house was cool. Like the house was really beautiful. And then, and by the way, you can't understand how shocked I was when I finally realized that these are the same two people who do Murder Dog Magazine. Yeah, a few people have made that connection, but it's almost like if you were to draw the Venn diagram where the overlap between that music and the, this this 80s stuff, the the <laughs> the only point of intersection is almost is Eric. I don't know. I mean <laughs> I have a theory. I have a theory. Yeah. My theory is this. Okay. Eric Eric is a revolutionary. To to Eric, not to speak for Eric, nor would I ever try to, music is a form of revolution. Doesn't matter whether it's post punk, folk you know, gangster hip hop, uh, uh, you know, revolution is revolution. Uh, um, disrupting is disrupting. Speaking for the poor or, or the downtrodden or the, or the overlooked is, is, is just as applicable, whether it's, you know, hip hop or whether it's detuned guitars and post punk. And I think that that's the common denominator is just the rebellion. The rebellion and kind of revolutionary spirit of the music, and I, I think, I, I personally, I think that's, I, I think that's what attracted Eric and Mary to that. That is definitely what I think. You know, coming back to. This Spawn Ranch and then, you know, that that compilation, it seems like those came out at pretty much the same, roughly the same time, 87. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, I think the I think the comp probably came out first. I mean, it's interesting. I, I don't know how much of anything 
Eric thought about what we would now call marketing or 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 release strategy, you know, I think. But but it would be smart to to put out the compilation first with a couple tracks on it. If you're getting ready to release a full length album uh, by an artist, because you want to try to see, you know, if there's any, you know, you want some people to have their appetites wet to the extent they're ever going to be. And then you release a full project. So. um and again, yeah, Brad, Bob, and I just can't believe we're in, we're on a record, period. <laughs> and so not not to mention compiled with a bunch of other artists that are also weird and also creative. You know, I don't like the I don't like every single artist on the on the records, but but I, I you know, just to be compiled and thought of that seriously, to to be considered serious art well enough to be. On a, on a vinyl compilation was just my, mind blowing to, to, to Bob Brad and I, you know, it really really was. And uh, again, keeping that same packaging aesthetic. That's another thing I liked. Eric stuck to his guns, man. I mean, like every single did thing he did in that period has a similar aesthetic on the packaging yeah. side, you know. And um, I love stuff like that. I mean, that 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 I love. You can tell a four, back then. You could tell a four AD record. You from from you know forty feet away. You you could see the artwork and know that's that's Ivo. That's four AD. Or that's you know that's twenty three envelope. Um, you know that's Midnight Records. You know it's just a certain feel, and that's now you know now pre internet you you realize yeah that was marketing. That was that was how they wanted you to trust. That if something looked a certain way or was on a certain label, it was going to have a certain feel, and that is, you know, whether he did it consciously or subconsciously, that's what Eric, I think, did with Insight and Wiring Department. Yeah, and his flyers also—they're all very recognizable. Uh, if you uh, come across, you know, whenever I come across a, a show that uh, maybe one of his bands was involved in, I can always tell if he made the flyer yeah. or, or someone else, or, or I feel like I can always tell. And, uh, how, how much longer was Spawn Ranch, uh, together after, after that? I mean, I, I, I imagine you were still together when the LP finally came out. Oh yeah. Yeah. I remember doing record quote unquote record release shows. And, uh, I think that record probably helped us get some of our bigger opening slots. The band ended mainly for one reason. It ended because Brad got accepted to MIT and had gra okay. graduated from University of Michigan, where he was during the band. And I think, I always tell this as a joke, I know the spirit is accurate. I don't know if the band is accurate, but I do remember Brad saying, I got accepted to this school called MIT. So, you know, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to make that gig next month. And I go, Brad, we're opening for Sonic Youth. You, what the hell is MIT? <laughs> <laughs> and who gives a shit? We got to open for Sonic Youth. And he kind of pat me on the shoulder and he goes, one day you'll understand. <laughs> uh, but yeah, at some point we did a trip to drive Brad out to Boston. And we played some shows in Boston, I think. I think we played a show in Boston. To be the kind of farewell, um, and we 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 all knew, we, you know, without Brad, there's there's no point. And I believe Bob ended up moving out there for a while with him. But um, yeah, yeah, that was so. But 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 to answer your question, we there was definitely overlap from record release to to the band to 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 Bob and and Brad moving to Boston. Certainly, Brad. I think Bob went too. But yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Because I, I you know the, I'm not sure if you're aware of this that. The Spawn Ranch LP was the only, only non Glorious Den LP, or, or not not kind of in the compilation that that came out on that label, because there were only you know what two Glorious Den records, the compilation, and then Spawn Ranch thing. And you know they had some other stuff they were working on uh -huh. that ended up on other labels. But um, interesting. And, and then so the the label because it was completely a shoestring operation no, it was eric and it's i mean now i know what it was i i i you know yes i work at universal music group and and it 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 doesn't necessarily always reflect my personal taste but i certainly am aware of major versus indie and back then it was true indie indie and yeah that that now i realize you know who paid the bill you know who paid matt wallace eric did Eric wrote a personal check, and I'm sure he had deals and kind of bartered, and you know it's a community, and you know everyone kind of I owe you one, you owe me one kind of thing. But 
Bottom line is, yeah, that's a that, that's a two person shop. That was Eric and Mary. Both financially, promotion, production, whole nine yards. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I cause I was kind of curious, you know. I, I don't know, obviously, like you all didn't have big, big time expectations, but I mean, how how did it seem to to work out uh with you know the record? With I guess it was able to get distributed in stores, but was yeah, I don't know. Were you? How, yeah, how, I, guess, I mean, yeah. listen, 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 listen. I I don't know how many records Eric pressed on these things. I I, I would I wouldn't be surprised if there was only a thousand copies of of Thickly Settled on the planet. You know. Okay. Um, again, he's paying for this out of his own pocket, so pressing was minimal. I think there may have been. I remember there was a review by Dave Henderson, who was an influential UK critic. And he said something nice about the album that was mind blowing in UK press. And I know that might have made its way to some eyeballs. But for the most part, it was, you know, I don't want to say lost. Well, I will say lost. Yeah, it was it was one of, of you know, hundreds and thousands of independent records that were made during the 80s that really tend to be regional. So I'm sure. You know, I'm sure there's a couple hundred houses in the Bay Area that have the album. And we certainly, you know, we were, quote, you know, we didn't certainly weren't paid. So we we got product. So we probably had about a box of 100 ourselves. We'd sell at shows. So there's going to be some copies that made its way around in the Michigan area. And, you know, I, I can't remember if we were taking it to the record stores locally. Eric did have some distribution, but, but you know, nothing, nothing. There was no global distribution of this record, but you know how did it work for us? I mean, depends on what your barometer is. For 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 Brad and I and Bob to be documented and have something that we created and be able to hold it and listen to it and um, know that it was real and not a dream, then the whole damn thing was a complete success. Well, this would be a story for another time, but your um your subsequent band, Brad told me a little bit about as well, that that you all got on the verge of having a major label release and then the label folded. Yes, so this is actually yeah. this is actually about to it'll never reconcile. And the singer of the second band, Majesty Crush, his name is was Dave Strauder, will not be around to see it. But we're about to get a partial uh, karmic positive payback on that because a label called Numero Group is is in about two months. I think the release release date is March. Can't remember the date in March. Is going to put out a retrospective compile work of Majesty Crush. Oh, okay. Including vinyl and a book and 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 not a not a book like like a book is to William York, but but but. You know. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> inside the vinyl, you know, inside right. the packaging will be a nice booklet. Yeah. And um, it's a project we've been working on for a while. They've been re-releasing digital stuff for um, ever since we signed, which has been about the last year. So yeah, Majesty Crush is about to, again, wish Dave was around to see it, but um, it's about to kind of get a little shine and maybe even more shine, uh, certainly more shine than it did when it actually existed. Hobie, as you know, joined Spawn Ranch later. So yes, you asked me, what was it like after the album came out? So one of the things it's like is we have a new band member, and his name is Hobie Eklund, and he joined Spawn Ranch. He lived in Ann Arbor. I didn't want a bass player. I was obsessed with tinniness and rhythm and tinniness. And when I say tinniness, I mean treble. Like like my my favorite sound at that point was Roland S. Howard, the guitar player for Birthday Party. Okay. I wanted to hear that, and I wanted to hear Jesus and Mary Chain feedback. Who needs a fucking bass? <laughs> and I say that to be funny. Like, um, so I didn't necessarily want a bass player in Spawn Ranch, but Brad said this guy Hobie really is interested in what you guys, what we're doing, and he's gonna come, and he's gonna. He, Brad didn't say he's in the band, but he said he's, he wants to come jam, and Hobie rode down in his motorcycle, 
and he had, with a base strapped to the back of his back. I'm shocked he didn't fly off this motorcycle. Down from Ann Arbor to my family's house where I grew up, same place Spawn Ranch started. And um, next thing you know, we kind of had a bass player. And, you know, Hobie did add, I think the one issue is he never really got... he. Spawn Ranch has a compilation that came out on Deus Records. Right, yeah. And that has some... Anything on that that is not already on Thickly Settled, Hobie probably plays on. So at least he's he's fi he finally has some Spawn Ranch recordings out in the world. Before that, he had nothing. It was just it was just thickly settled, which predates him. Okay. But that's one of the big events. Like after thickly settled comes out, we 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 really have a beefed up lineup, and so we're doing those songs live, and they're obviously you know more filled out. And now I look back and go, wow, bass helps. You know what was I talking about? And. You know, I'm sure we would have liked to have recorded a full album with Hobie and 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 all those things. But again, Brad gets the MIT. There is a pause, and then I connect with Dave Strader, who we were high school friends, and we live we move into a place together, and we say, "Hey, we're gonna start a band." And Hobie was, uh, you know, Hobie found out about it, or we told him about it, and 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 then Hobie then became a member of the next band. So Hobie and I have been in two bands together. Okay. And that was the that was the continuity between those two was was you two. Yes, yes, the rhythm section. Basically, the rhythm section of Spawn Ranch becomes the rhythm section of Majesty Crush. Okay. And and, and by the way, David Strader, the singer of Majesty Crush, the reason one of the reasons we knew, I knew I wanted to create with him, besides the fact that I'd known him for many years, was he came into the studio because Spawn Ranch was trying to record Brad and I. <laughs> you know, we were just as much in the Cabaret Voltaire as. Savage Republic. So we're trying to figure out how to implement electronics into what we're doing. We had just played with Psychic TV and Psychic TV had discovered rave culture because the Summer of Love happened in, in England in 1987, I believe. So Genesis Peoria at the time was, you know, completely had become a techno shaman. So we um, opened up for Psychic TV probably for the second time, third time, but this time it's a completely different animal. They're they're like basically throwing a rave before that word was used. And that, you know, Acid House, people were saying the word Acid House. So Brad and I want to have an Acid House song. And so we go into the studio and we try to record this song that was called Glass. It's, you know, and also Wax Tracks. Wax Tracks record was extremely you know, that label out of Chicago was extremely, well, first Colorado, then Chicago, extremely influential to us. And Dave Strader came in to sing. We, we thought it'd be cool to have him come in, over and just do some improv vocals, which were incredible, incredibly spooky. And that that is one of the reasons why I knew that, like, Strader and I was probably going to do the next project, Managed to Crash. Yeah. 